Sure, please. So that is that Del Campo is a registered architect, designer, and educator. Founded together with Sandra Meninger in Vienna, 2003. Span is a globally art acting practice, best known for their application of contemporary technologies in architecture production. The award-winning architect designs are informed by computational methodologies, artificial intelligence algorithm, and algorithm modeling. Contemporary theory and philosophy inquiry, most recently, Matthias Del Campo was awarded the Accelerate at CERN Fellowship, the AAI Studio Prize, and was elected into the boards of directors of Acadia, which is one of the most rec mostly recognized um, platform for for papers, research papers, and researchers as well. Pan's work is in, in the permanent collection of RAC, the MAK in Vienna, the Benetton Collection, and Albertina. He is Associate Professor at Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning, University of Michigan. And we are honored to have you as a participant uh, as, uh, and, part, and as, a, as a speaker. And we are uh, more than happy to have uh, participants in Zoom as well as in Facebook. Uh, and once the session is over, we'll be uploading it uh, on YouTube as well, so we can share it to the maximum number of students across the world. So, uh, on behalf of Sashi School of Architecture, on behalf of our director, Kai Tinmam, on behalf of our chairman, uh, Rajdeep Sir, and our entire fraternity, we are more than uh, we honored to have you here, Matthias. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you for the kind invitation to join you and to talk a little bit about my, my work uh, as architect as well as researcher. Um, uh, so my, again, my name is Matthias Del Campo. I'm Associate Professor of Architecture at Taubman College for Architecture and Urban Planning at the University of Michigan, and I specialize on computational design in architecture. So with no further ado, I would like to share my screen uh, with you. Do you see it? No. Let me know when, let me know when you see it. I think they're going to be here. We see it. Just, you see it. OK, great. So uh, today's lecture, I'm going to talk exclusively about the, um, um, our research and work in terms of artificial intelligence in architecture. So SPAN runs actually three offices, one in Vienna, one in Shanghai, and one in Detroit. And um, I'm basically, just to give you a bit of a background, uh, Vienna has been always sort of obsessed with advanced technology and architecture and how it expresses, how it can be used as an opportunity for new ideas. And within that tradition, I'm also, whoops. And that's actually also what my office does. So we, we actually try to, um, to embody these ideas uh, of advanced, this advanced possibilities in architecture and put them into in use in terms of designing architectural pieces. And for us, this encompasses every scale. So it doesn't matter whether it's a product design or it's an entire city. For us, we can, we can really apply those things to a variety of different conditions. Now for today, we have to ask, first of all, what is artificial intelligence, right? So there is a short definition for it. Uh, of course, you could do an entire lecture only about the definition, which would go on for an hour or so, but to keep it short, there are three very specific aspects that you have to consider when you're talking about artificial intelligence. So one is intentionality. So there must be whatever is operating on the background, whether it's you as a human or if it is a neural network as a piece of artificial intelligence, there must be an intention behind it. Like why is it doing that? Yeah? Then of course it, had to, it has to possess uh, intelligence. And that's a little bit more complicated because there is like a variety of different definitions of how to measure and how to define intelligence. For, for artificial intelligence, it's probably more about the awareness of uh, the awareness of something about its position in the world. Like, for example, if you have an, if you have a car that understands when it's driving along the street, what is a pedestrian, what is a bicycle driver, driver what is the street and what is um, the, 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 the trees around, it has awareness, right, of where it is positioned in the world. So that would be a primitive example for that. And it has to be adapt, it has to have adaptability. So any intelligent uh, um, um, uh, player or, or, or actor has to have specific adaptability to its environment. And that also defines um, 
intelligence. So all of these things together define for uh, uh, an, an intelligent agent, and we can translate those things into um, an artificial environment like a computational program. So the question is, why should we use AI, or why to use an AI at all? So there's a re uh, reason to do this, and it's in this sentence, it's better to teach machines how to learn instead of how to do things. And what it what it means is, for example, if you are uh, in a car factory, for example, I, I, um, and you <clears throat> program a robot to weld specific points of a car, right? So you can basically do that. You, you, you program every single point. That's actually how it's done most of the time. You teach a robot how to weld specific points in a car. Now imagine you want to change very quickly which model of car you're producing, right? You would have to reteach the robot new welding points. Again, this takes time, it's very costly, but if you use artificial intelligence, you would just teach a robot which are the best points to weld a car from millions and millions of welding points that it were done over the years and collected as data until that neural network learns by, by looking at the car or the pieces of the car which are the best point to weld it. So you don't have to teach it anymore specifically point by point. It learns on itself what to do, okay? So there's currently two specific trajectories of how to use AI, or let's say from the AI research part. One is the so-called generalized AI. So what is a generalized AI? If you think about robots in movies like Ex Machina or the agents in The Matrix, or data in Star Trek, yeah? These are um, generalized AIs. They can do a lot of things at the same time. Yeah, they can think, they can walk at the same time, they can talk at the same time as they're looking at things. So they can actually combine a variety of things and that's also how we as humans operate, right? So in, in considering this, how the human body works, we have a lot, a lot of processes that are going in parallel to make our bodies work. Like my heart is pumping, my lungs are getting air in and out without, without me having to think about that. But it's very complex things that are happening at the same time and all in parallel. Uh, I'm, I'm keeping balance, I'm not falling off my chair. So all these things. Now, it's very difficult to achieve that with artificial intelligence because this, this needs enormous amounts of calculation power. So generalized AIs are rather the minority of research right now. The more common research right now is called applied AIs, which are, various, are artificial intelligence parts that can um, do very specific things. I'm showing you here this row of, of, of numbers. So um, how do you teach an AI? Or one of the, one of the applications of specialized uh, applied AIs is recognizing text, for example, or recognizing speech. And I'm going to show you an example of recognizing numbers. This was one of the oldest uh, applications for AI. Think just about, about you writing a check by hand no one today in a bank checks those numbers manually. They're all get, uh, feeded into a scanner and then a neural network recognizes the numbers. How does he recognize these numbers? This is basically how it works. And this is like a two-stage uh, neural network here where you feed, you have to train first uh, a neural network, which means you have to explain to a machine what is a five, what is a one, what is a three, and to do this, you feed this machine thousands and thousands and thousands of examples. That's actually the databases that you have to build up and, and repeatedly say, that's a five, that's a five, that's a five. So if you do this several thousand times, the neural network will start to recognize within a jumble of numbers that you present to him in a scan, what's a five, yeah? And you do this with every number. The more you train the machine, of course, the more precise the outcome is. And at some point it can start to learn on its own. Yeah. So today, because after, I don't know, like 20 years of using neural networks in banking systems, the number recognition is extremely precise. So there's almost no error anymore because of this amount of data. Okay. Another aspect of this um, newly evolving ecology of perceiving the world I think is the post-human perception of the world. And what I mean by that is post-human, not in the sense of a world without humans. Yeah? Post-human means 
rather after the, the dominance of humanity over agency. And let me explain this briefly. Um, so and, and since the um, idea of the humanist project in the 16th century, there was always the idea that the humanity is the dominant species on the world. So we have agency over everything. Agency meaning we control everything and we define everything, we design everything. We paint as painters, we make compositions, yeah. So there's like this dominance in terms of intellectual ideas and, and, and possibilities. With the rise of AI, that is coming into question because there's a second player coming into the design world, which is not human. So that's why it's post-human. So that we, are, we, are about, we are moving away from the humanist project that started in the 16th century and entering a new project, which probably has more to do with shared agency and shared ideas, um, shared, shared talent, and so on, which is a quite interesting problem. I like, for example, how AIs see our world. So this is, for example, uh, a drone perception of a thing. It's, it's um, Hollywood Boulevard. It was done by MIT. And the idea here is that the, the different colorations describe uh, different um, distances. Yeah. So these are, these are things that are actually done so that cars can recognize their environment. And I think it's wonderful how um, uh, a different entity perceives the world so differently than we as humans do. Uh, a little bit different. I mean, we know, for example, that bees also see the world differently because they have another spectrum of light coming through their eyes. But in this case, it's something that was generated not biologically, but synthetically, that is actually have a different perception of our, of our world. Let's talk a little bit about AI and creativity. So the question is, can AIs be creative? This is a short example. It's called the uh, Bob and Ellis experiment. It was done by Facebook, the Facebook Research Unit. Uh, and the idea behind this was to create um, an AI that is able to discuss with a customer on the phone banking problems. And the AI should be so good that the person, the, the real person, the human person on the phone would not recognize that he's not, that he's not talking to a human, that he's actually talking to an AI. So he would really be convinced that he's talking to a person. Now, that's a problem on its own, but the interesting problem here is that this group, in order to test that AI, started to let them discuss with each other, like two AIs discussing with each other problems of economy. This was basically designed to train the neural network to become better. So they turn on the experiment, they come back next day, and these two AIs had developed their own language to discuss these problems. Yeah. So what you see here is that result. It's still based on English, but you cannot make out what it actually means, what they're talking about here. I think this is, a, this is a fascinating example because it actually shows a possibility that AI can be creative. They creatively develop a new language to be more efficient when they discuss the problem, right? The next example, um, so that's about creativity in AI. So this could be evidence for that. Now let's talk a bit about machine hallucinations. This is my main uh, research uh, that's going on at the moment, which is using all the things that I was explaining before as a creative tool for architecture. And for that, we use uh, convolutional neural networks that actually can learn architectural features and apply them to, to any other given model. Yeah? I'm not gonna go into detail with this, but I will say that you have to create large image databases in order to be able to hallucinate or dream. Or, and by the way, all these terms like hallucination and dreaming and so on, they all come from computer science. This is nothing I made up. Yeah? These are terms that are get, really getting used by computer science. And, and earlier they were used actually by neuroscience that actually um, are now coming into architecture to explain specific processes of design. So this is one of the results, for example, from one of my studios at Taubman College, yeah, which was, this is the work of the students, Hannah Dougherty, Mariana Moreira de Calvaro, and Iman Suleiman. They made something very interesting in that they created an image database based on their own work. Like the, the image on the left is one, a rendering from one of the students, and they created hundreds and hundreds of those renderings. And the image on the right is a result of a deep dreaming process, a deep dreaming process where they actually were able to, trans to transplant their own sensibility, their own idea of 
design and sh shape into an existing uh, building. I'm gonna jump over this one. You probably all know this image here. Uh, this is one of the interesting things about uh, hallucinating, uh, um, is that, or deep dreaming, is that um, you can train a neural network to um, read specific things in images. So for example, this is a portrait of Van Gogh. Van Gogh is a very, very, you know, they like to, to use Van Gogh as an example in neuroscience and computer science. Anyways, uh, so this is the portrait from Van Gogh and the neural network was trained to recognize lizards, fishes, and birds in that image, right? So how this works is basically that you train a neural network. Um, so let me put it this way. If you only give uh, a neural network images of, of birds, of lizards and trees and flowers, that's all it's gonna understand from the world, right? Nothing else, because it doesn't know anything else from the world apart from this couple of you know, images. So when, when you give him any random image that is not a bird, a lizard, or a flower, he's, he's going to try to make sense out of that image by trying to see where in this image are birds, flowers, and lizards. So, and that's why you get these results because it's, the neural network is really trying to make sense of the world based on his knowledge. It's like the, it's like the problem of Plato's cave, if you're aware of that. Uh, style transfer is also something that is quite interesting in architecture. I'm also, again, not going to go too much into detail here, but based, it's based on the same principle in that you can use a style and translate to, that to an existing image. Of course, you can use that also to create um, art, and I'm going to jump also over this one. This would take too long to ex explain that. But what I'm interested into is that style has been almost like a, a, a forbidden word in architecture for almost 100 years. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting that this is a famous example of a theory about uh, style by Gottfried Semper in the 19th century. 20th century really ignored the idea of style. <clears throat> but I think it's interesting that it's coming back through the use of artificial intelligence because style transfer is a, is a main technique used um, in, in AI. <clears throat> so result could be style transferring between modern monotony and Baroque variation and creating these sort of images out of that in result. Now, one of the main problems here is that um, all these images are 2D and our profession is three-dimensional. So we need to find methods of how to use this in three dimensions. And this is an example from my office where we try to uh, make a style transfer on the ceiling of this project here in 3D. We found a method that allows us to, to, to make style transfers between 2D and 3D. And that's one of the results of it. This is another one. This was actually for the competition entry for the, for the uh, Austrian pavilion at the Dubai Expo this year. Unfortunately, we didn't win it, but we were really, really close to winning it. It's a shame we're not building this. So again, the translation into 3D, and this is uh, the ex an example of that. It's so-called 2D to 3D style transfer. It was developed by uh, Hiroharu Kato, Yoshitaki Ushika, and Tatsuta Harada yeah, from the University of Tokyo. And uh, they were kind enough to make this publicly available. So we actually used the idea and uh, worked with students on a variety of different projects that take up this idea and apply it to architectural projects. So this is by Sigan Chen, Vararika Singh, and Mengyan Wang. Um, uh, it was a beautiful project in Tokyo. And this is a project where you, you clearly can see the style transfer into 3D uh, by uh, Mariana Sanchez and Viti Wang from Pen Design. Here's another one example from them. And then going also into sections and more specific modeling of the project. Now, my, my, my practice span is in the lucky situation to have been, uh, have been commissioned to build a small project that is based on this technique. It's the so-called robot garden um, for the robotics department of the University of Michigan. And it's really a cool project because it's, it is as post-human as it gets, because this is basically, um, let me go to the final image here, this one. This is basically a testing ground 
for robots. So it's not even a garden for humans, it's literally a garden for robots. Yeah? So the idea here is that the university robotics department is developing robots that have two legs, like humans, and they needed a testing ground to, to test the, 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 how the robots walk on different grounds, like rocks uh, or earth or sand. Yeah? And we use the style transfer technique to, um, to design this entire garden condition. Uh, this would be a longer lecture, so I'm going to keep it there. But I think it's, an, it's, it's, a proof, it's a proof of concept project that these ideas of style transfer or using AI and architecture can be really translated into built environment. So it's not just um, pure speculation. And this is a current shot. We had to stop the construction site, of course, because of COVID-19. Uh, but I, I hope we're going to resume construction uh, early fall and finish the whole thing up. Um, and you can scale up those, those techniques. So they don't have to be just buildings or product design. They can also be urban. And it's, I think it's amazing that you can take the entire history of architecture and train a neural network to understand how to apply the variations of these ideas on different sites in the world. So again, it, it, we're just in the start with this. We're just beginning, I would say. There's much more things we need to learn in terms of how to apply uh, artificial intelligence in architecture, but the opportunities are absolutely amazing. This is one of the images we made recently where we just out for fun, we were speculating what would cities on the moon look like. Yeah. But you can, of course, apply this to every, uh, every site that you think of. Uh, we do some writing, uh, so I have this, this book here called Sublime Bodies. It's in Chinese and English, if you're interested. It's orderable through Amazon. The proceedings from the Acadia Conference 2016, which, which we hosted in Michigan, and uh, the edition of AD called Evoking Through Design, Contemporary Moods in Architecture, I can highly recommend also this one. And if you're interested, you can also look up my PhD. It's, it's freely available online. Uh, can be downloaded from RMIT. And yes, uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Should I keep sharing my screen or do you want me to shut it down? No, no, if you want to share a resource or your book or something, you can uh, show them. If you, if, you go to my, if you go to my Instagram and um, you can, or Facebook, you can find the information about the book. Otherwise, uh, both, both books uh, are available on Amazon. If you just type in my name in Amazon, you'll find them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's great. Because a lot of uh, you know, a lot of students who would like to you know have a grab uh, on uh, you know updating themselves about even myself as well. I would like to you know assist in artificial. Yeah. And the and the PhD, as I was saying, the PhD can be found on the webpage of RMIT. Uh, if you look for my name, or you, again, if you Google my name and PhD RMIT, you're probably going to find it right away. Yeah. That's amazing. But this is this is freely available, uh, so you can just download it and read it if you like. Yeah, I think that's a great resource for students you know, to, to update themselves on uh, yeah. artificial intelligence. So moving on to a dialogue, um, um, you can maybe sh stop sharing your uh, presentation. Yeah, we have you. So how will uh, artificial intelligence impact the architecture discipline, like you know, conventional forms of architecture? Um, yeah. so we already have mapped it, uh, drones mapping our uh, sites. We have robots uh, in urban design, uh, and we are involved in them. But uh, how far in either in Michigan or in Spain do you use artificial yeah, so I think you have to differentiate two different areas where you're going to be using this. So there is one area, which is, uh, I would say, the area of optimization. Yeah? And, and then the area of, um, of, of creativity and sensibility. So these are two different areas. In, in terms of optimization, the good thing is because you can train neural networks with so much data from the past, you can, um, you can really make a very informed decision about your design, yeah? So let's say you feed a neural network with several, uh, let's hundred thousands or maybe millions uh, of plans of former social housing projects, yeah? Mm -hmm. And you classify them. You say like, this is a good example, this is a bad example, yeah? And this is where you as a human come into play in training this neural network. But if you do that and say, here is my site, 
make me a proposal of a good plan for a housing project on that site. And it will give you variations that are based on your classification, like the ones that, so it's gonna start to learn if it's good or bad, right? And of course, at the end of the day, you as an architect are gonna decide whether you like it or not, but at least you will have an idea of where a good project could go, with what's the direction of the project. So it can help you in making decisions. Or at the same time, you can also, um, for example, create, that's something we're really interested in creating is an application that allows you to check your plans for, um, for example, if they have mistakes in terms of uh, the code, building code, yeah? So you actually feed in your network with your entire building code of your country, yeah? And, and then you just scan your, or you, you, you open your plan in whatever software you're using and you have maybe a, a plugin or something that can tell you, can, can point out the distance of the building here to the site edge is too small. And it tells you it has to be this much. So you're actually saving a lot of time in checking plans because the, one of the things you have to do in an architecture practice a lot is checking and checking, checking plans. Like yeah. making sure everything's right. We have this issue. Uh, yeah, we have this issue right now when uh, uh, we have a software which which uh, checks plans after we finish and apply for the sanction. You know, apply for that. So what happens is that okay, maybe it takes 15 days to check. So we lose 15 days, and then we get back the uh, mistakes, and then we work on for for a week. And then again, we send the, the um, for, for the for the for the sanction. And if there is another mistake found by the computer uh, software, we have to work. So, um, like you mentioned, maybe there could be a real-time plugin which has the code and which can inform us uh, in real time. So uh, that's that could be interesting as well. Yeah. So this is definitely. So there's several applications which are practical that you can do with it, and I can think of more. Uh, and, but, and on the other side, um, in terms of creativity and, and like what it, what, it, what it means for our contemporary age, I think that one of the cooler things about this development is that it's probably the very first uh, genuinely 21st century design technique. Yeah, because it's nothing that has been developed before. It was just not possible to do it before because of the calculation power necessary. And, and uh, so I've, just to, for your information, I'm not developing these things on my own. Mm -hmm. I'm developing these things together with uh, robotics and with computer science from the University of Michigan. Because these are the guys who have far deeper insight into the programming of the things than I have. Um, I can understand what they're doing, but they're just much faster than me in, in, in scripting and programming, that's clear. And um, uh, this is an incredible uh, case of um, uh, interdisciplinary work. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I think it, it, any time you want to do progress in your in your pro, in your profession, I think you have to look for these sort of interdisciplinary notes that that actually make things possible. Yeah, and I have to thank actually the robotics department, specifically the director Jesse Grissel and Alexa Carlson, who were amazingly supportive in doing this and. Danish Sayed, uh, as, as, uh, who has been helping us out for, uh, from the computer science department. Um, and, and Justin Johnson, who is really providing also amazing uh, support for developing further 3D applications in AI, which is like the next step. Well, I, I remember seeing a project where uh, architects or uh, researchers teaching the robot with, uh, with information uh, and then the robot Sort of in working with just uh, codes, starts to learn to pick uh, objects with uh, colors, with pick objects with um, memory. Um, so, how far could we use these kind of sort of artificial intelligence in construction industry? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a good question. So, uh, I mean, there are certain things that are currently being developed. I, I mentioned a couple of times cars, right? And uh, uh, that that what what is applicate what is applied in cars a lot is computer vision, right? So they actually can understand the environment. And I do have um, a couple of students who are working on using a computer vision or machine vision actually machine vision actually using machine vision to inform a robot about different shapes and boundaries and so on in order to understand where to operate and what to pick up and so on. 
And I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's an ongoing process. Uh, I'm sure we're gonna see this year one or two really interesting applications of how to use machine vision for construction. Because you have to consider this. Uh, the same like with the car, you also have similar problems on the construction side, right? I mean, a robot is a huge machine that is you know, very dangerous if you don't take care of it, right? I mean, it can kill you because it's yeah. very fast and so on. So if you can teach a robot to understand its environment and actually see, oh, there's a human coming into my, I have to stop now. Yeah, so, so that it understands how to respond to it or, or really to be gentle with the human, but more, more effective with you know, heavy things. Um, that's great. Also, for example, take, um, take the, the, the common example of stacking bricks with a robot. Yeah, so instead of, instead of pre-programming every position of a brick, you can actually teach a robot, okay, here's point A and here's point B, and I need the wall to curve around point C. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you don't do anything else. That's all the information the robot gets. And mm -hmm. he, he can on its own understand how to most effectively curve around that point. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. Looking forward for such codes and robots. I think KUKA and uh, ABB are working on such robots. Oh, absolutely. I think that this, this, is, this development is exploding at the moment. Right? There's like a lot of people that are jumping on to, to develop these. And, and, and I think it's great. And also, I think people are recognizing that not only in terms of efficiency or uh, they're super interesting, but also in terms of how they discuss our contemporary culture. Like, really, what, what do we mean as humans in this environment? How do we contribute? Right. Right. Like, what do, you, what do you advise, you know, students like there are students um, the, uh, like TSA school and other schools in India as well, who are part of this webinar here on Zoom and Facebook as well. Like, what do you, uh, you know, what is important for architects to understand how it works as well? I don't know. I mean, it's uh, it's a very specialized field, and I think every every way to be creative is welcome in our discipline. I don't think we have to uh, narrow it down to something specific. But I mean, if I can give you one advice, which is very useful for whatever kind of architecture you're doing is to learn Python. Uh, the, it, it has become more and more like the general language of scripting everywhere in the world and with a lot of different programs. Yeah? So you can, you can actually really do a lot with just one language instead of having to learn like five different computer languages. Yeah. One is enough. The other one, if you don't have access, like one thing is very important. All these things I was describing are computationally quite heavy, which means you, you need big computers. But there is a way around that. You can you can actually use cloud computing solutions, and I think that's one of the things that's going to come now very soon. Instead of buying you know expensive machines, you just rent online a heavy machine for an hour, and you can do a lot in an hour on such a machine. Right. And it's going to cost you just a couple of dollars. So that that's good. Um, I think you you guys as as, as students you have to start thinking about your position in the world, especially in a world that is changing so much as it is now. Um, understanding, you know, what the field of architecture can contribute to, to humanity, um, both in terms of its social function, its economical function, but also its cultural function, right? So there's like these three big areas where architecture is always part of. And it's, an, it's, an, it's a profoundly immersive art form. I still consider architecture being an art form. So it's, it's an immersive art form that you know, contributes to experience. And if there is one thing that the computers and robots still cannot do really well, is, is sort of projecting the vision of an experience in architecture. That's something that still is profoundly human, yeah? Although I'm trying everything to get rid of it with my AI stuff, yeah? But, but nonetheless, it's, it's still very, it's almost impossible to replicate that with an AI because one thing we can do, for example, as humans really well, which robots and AIs cannot do really good, is to recognize opportunity in an error, yeah? So when you did something wrong, but then you're like, wait a second, that's actually quite cool. Maybe I can do something with that, yeah? Uh, that, that moment where your brain is doing this really weird cross connections between actually a mistake and right. turning it into an into an advantage, that's something that robots still cannot do. Yeah, because it's also because we still don't understand exactly how our brain works. Like, why right. do we make these kind of weird cross connections? Yeah, 
almost these, these, these accidents that happen in our brain. We understand parts of how the brain works and that's how what we're applying to artificial intelligence, but you don't understand yeah. it completely yet. Right. So can, can you talk a little bit about the relationship of uh, human culture to this new ecology? Yeah, that, that's a very interesting problem. I mean, I mentioned at the beginning that, that there is like this new player on the playing field, which is artificial intelligence. So until now, there was always this idea that humanity is on the top of the pyramid in terms of culture, mm -hmm. uh, which is it's, it's, it's increasingly getting questioned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, even down to the point to understand that maybe even animals have a sort of culture, right? Because culture basically is the sharing of codes and ideas within a community, right? Um, so, um, and of course, there's a difference also between symbolic culture and material culture. Yeah. So Manuel de Landa, for example, has nice conversations around the topic. Um, and what what this new entity, what AI is contributing to this, uh, is I think for for the, for one, it's a, it's it's something that expands our mind, that allows us to think deeper into problems, and that on the other hand provides us with ideas and inspirations that otherwise would not happen. Yeah, I think that instead of having this pyramid, as I described before, where humanity is on the top of agency and creativity and culture we have something like a plateau, yeah, like two slope lines and a plateau. And on this plateau, we're going to see increasingly more actors. So it's not going to be just humanity contributing to culture. It's going to be a variety of different AIs. And AI is not something general. AI is just a generalization, right? Because there's like a, whole, a huge set of different techniques that are involved in that, you know, convolutional neural networks, generative adversarial networks, uh, graph CNNs, and so on. So there's like whole whole ecology of different things happening right now. What I think is amazing and what they can contribute to culture is to show us what with the existing knowledge of the world, which you can feed into an AI, how that starts to generate things that are, that are different, that are still maybe alien to us, but they are human in some way because the input is human. But the output is, 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 is different, interesting, innovative, inspiring, um, fantastic, uh, sometimes also very, um, uh, what is called, rätselhaft. Uh, they are, they're like a riddle. Uh, you have to solve the riddle to, to be able to make something out of that. And that, again, is, 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 an, is an amazing inspiration. And if you think about what it's currently doing to culture, there was this example of this painting in my lecture that I didn't talk mm -hmm. about. Okay. So that painting is, is by a Paris-based collective called Obvious. And mm -hmm. the painting is called, I think, uh, Belle Ami or something like that. Uh, and it was completely generated by a neural network. And the neural network was actually fed with data of portraits in, in European culture from the last thousand years or so. So it, it learned how a portrait has to look like and produced that portrait. That's right. not so exciting. That's not so exciting in itself. It's a pretty simple technique. What is exciting is that the painting was was sold at Thotapis for I think four hundred twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah, right. and it was recognized as the work from an AI, not from a right. human. So it's it shows that this sort of artificial creativity is already contributing to our culture. It's amazing. I didn't know about that. It's quite a new uh, a phenomena which is changing the way we look at art. And uh, hopefully, we'll have some, uh, you know, maybe pavilions like you showed, maybe which is, you know, uh, executed out artificial intelligence. So, we have an interesting question from, uh, from participants. And one, there's one interesting question where Kavan Kumaran has asked How will AI and machine learning change the future of? architectural education? Good question. Yeah. Um, so you have to think about the following. Um, think about how you learn about architecture. Or let me put it this way. Think about how you as a student learn about architecture styles. Most of the time, it's a professor showing you images, like telling you, this is Indian architecture, this is, this is Greek architecture, this is Gothic architecture, and so on. So it, he shows you images, right? right. And it's, it's, it doesn't happen very often that students can visit all of these buildings to learn how a style looks. You see images. 
And then there is a person, a discriminator in this case, mm -hmm. who is basically training you to understand what is what. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about uh, neural networks, they operate very similarly. You feed them with thousands of images and you, the discriminator, actually trains him to understand this is Gothic, this is modern architecture, this is Baroque architecture, and so on, yeah? Uh, now, what does this mean for the future of education? Yeah? Does it mean that from now on, we don't have to train students anymore in architecture history? I don't know, I, I, I doubt it. I think we still need to know a little bit at least about it. Really? Uh, but it, it would, it, 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 I think that when you start to compare those things with each other and you combine them in explaining to a student, now the test is you have to train now on your network to understand what is Gothic, that would be the test. Yeah, because then you know that the student actually understood what it is, if he's able to teach it to a machine. Yeah. In, in terms of other aspects of education, I see that a lot that machine learning is going to come into, uh, into optim optimization problems in school. Like when you are about, when you're supposed to optimize um, structures and things like that, those, those uh -huh. um, applications are going to come for sure. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other aspect you have to think about is, you know, that, you know, I don't know how exactly it is in India, but in the West, the, probably the fall semester is also going to be distant learning to resume and so on. So it means that you can actually start to communicate with your larger community of students through mm -hmm. using one tool online that is an AI driven, right? AI driven tool, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in, in other areas of education, um, I think it, it might even be possible that some areas are where AI will replace me as mm -hmm. a teacher, yeah, because you know, if, if you have an AI who can go through with you through mathematical problems, for example, or structural engineering problems, or as I was saying, uh, architecture history and so on, these are things that I think an AI can also teach a student. It's not necessarily said that you have to have a professor doing that. But when it comes to design decisions, like what I was describing before, these sort of weird cross connections in your brain, how to really progress with a design, where to find inspiration, I think that's going to be still human. So it's very likely that in the future we'll have a combination between human interaction, and then maybe we can go deeper into the intellectual problem, the, the historic problem of the architecture, its position in our contemporary age, like thinking about things that maybe are a little bit harder to do with an AI, but that are profoundly human, like really understanding what our culture means is something that only we as humans can discuss, I think, yeah. But in a lot of our other areas, which are more pragmatic, I can see that AI education will come. That's quite an interesting answer as well. Looking at possibilities where uh, now pilots are getting replaced by drones, um, cinematographers are getting replaced by drones, and drone photography is starting to replace a lot of uh, people in, uh, who, who were into uh, Aerial photography, aerial mapping, and yeah. cinematography as well. And now we still sit and code and uh, we, we communicate with drones and uh, in you know, through, through scripted languages so that drones communicate with us as well. Um, there's one more question. Do you think that we can rebuild the history of architecture culture with the help of AI? Can you repeat that? Do you think that we can rebuild our history of architecture, culture with the help of AI? Rebuild? Yeah, I mean recreate. 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 Yeah. Well, it depends on what you want to do. Like, for example, if you want to, let's say, understand, if you want to build a Baroque palace today, yeah, with the help of AI, absolutely. Okay. No problem. But yeah. I don't think that's the, uh, but I personally don't think that's the challenge. I think that's, that's, that, that might be, for example, interesting for conservation projects or renovation projects and things like that. Like imagine, for example, that you have a house from the 17th century, right? There was an earthquake, half of it broke away and that is gone, right? So you can actually go ahead and first of all, you scan the rest of the building you train an AI to understand the features, like, you know, how does the top of the column look like? How does the window frame look like? And so on, you train it with all these things, yeah? 
and then tell him to reconstruct the other side so that it fits perfectly. No problem. That's easy. Right. Yeah. Uh, so absolutely, I think for, for preservation projects and so on, this will become very, very useful, especially if it's not, I was talking about an earthquake, right? Right. But ima imagine you have uh, imagine you have a ruin from two thousand years ago, yeah, mm. which is only just scattered pieces lying around, yeah, and a lot of them are missing. Right. You scan all those pieces, and then you train a neural network with other examples from the similar era and similar culture. Mm. Train the network to understand how would they have built, yeah, right. and and the this training will allow to reconstruct this couple of scattered pieces of a building into something that represents what it used to be 2000 years ago. That's nice. And then the same algorithm can be used for education as well. Yeah? Yes, absolutely. When we have a conservation project, the same algorithm can be used as well for construction as well as for, you know, to document education. So I think, yeah. uh, uh, I think the future would be artificial intelligence of yeah, you were suggested to learn Python, like uh, which program can architecture students in their undergraduate practice that to, to create us? Well, un unfortunately, there is no software now, per se, that can do that. It's a, it's a way to new development, to have mm -hmm. uh, one specific software doing it. So uh, I can tell you that we are working on releasing a grasshopper, uh, grasshopper component that will, be, it will allow you to do some of those functions. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. This will be publicly available. Mm -hmm. I, I hope in fall, but honestly, I think more likely it's gonna be January, February next year. Okay. And uh, other than that, I can, I can really recommend to go on GitHub. GitHub yes. is, a, is a repository and, and just, just look for neural network applications mm -hmm. uh, or things like style transfer, for example. Yeah, they're all available via GitHub. Yeah, and just look, th uh, read through the descriptions and, and and templates, and try to do it on your own. Again, that's when that's when learning Python helps because all of the things are all coded in Python. So if you want to change anything in this code, which is basically the thing you have to do to make it your own, you have to learn Python. Because we teach uh, Grasshopper in uh, school. Sorry. We teach Grasshopper in our school. For yes. Graduates. Yeah. yeah. So that's why we are want. That's why we want to do this grasshopper component because we know that there is a big audience for that. Yeah. Right. Um, and then the other thing you can do is there is something called Google Deep Dream. Yeah. Which is a web page. Yeah. Google. And Google Deep Dream. Google Deep Dream. Yes. And that allows you to take two images and do style transfers, yeah? So you can, you can start playing around with that, you know, to, to, to have a feeling first what it's doing. Of course, you cannot change the code there. It's really just a web page, but at least it gives you a sense of things you can do, yeah? Changing yeah. the code is, 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 is what it's all about. That's when you start to do really interesting things. And do you see in the future, uh, because BIM is becoming uh, you know, quite important in building information, modeling is quite important for, uh, it's becoming a significant topic all around the world. Where do you see uh, BIM architecture modeling and artificial intelligence meeting at one point? Yeah, no, this is, this is absolutely also a crucial point. And I remember having a couple of conversations about it already. Uh, I mean, you know, the good thing about artificial intelligence, it's, it's, it, it, it is its ability to, uh, to deal with really big amount of data, yeah? And building information modeling is full of that, yeah? So what I, what I would think would be super interesting is that the cool thing about build, BIM is that every single component within the building has a tag, right? You exactly yeah. know what it is and where it is. Yeah. And, and you can play them out as Excel sheets. Like you can do Excel sheets with all components that are in a BIM model, right? Yeah. That's an amazing base to, to do something really fascinating with building information modeling. Because if yeah. you combine it with AI, you can, for yeah. example, uh, train a neural network to understand all these components, yeah? From buildings to rooms to parts to the nail, if you want, yeah? 
And, and then, for example, you model a very raw model of something you want to build, like a really raw mass model. Yeah? And then you tell an AI to populate that with a specific set of, uh, of things. Like I need 50 hotel rooms, I need two lobbies, I need three restaurants. Uh, and uh, okay, make the model. Yeah? And, it can, and it creates this model in short right. time. Yeah? So that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, of course, this means a lot of training. I mean, this would need a big team of people training a neural network for half a year or a year until it works. But when this works, it saves you probably tons of time and money and yeah. everything. Yeah. We can save manpower on that. You know? We can save yeah. a lot. We don't require 400 architects, 300 architects. But it, it, would, not be, it would be a controversial debate as well. Would uh, artificial intelligence would uh, remove, uh, like increase unemployment? Like, what, what is this? No, I have another position to that. So, so my position uh, is that I, I firmly believe in um, uh, in an automated future where we have uh, uh, universal basic income. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, because if we con if we continue with the automation with robots that we're doing now, it will mean that, of course, um, the, the the classical idea of work is going not to work anymore. It's not going to be uh, applicable anymore, right? So we have to think about other possibilities. And if, 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 if you, for example, have a universal basic income and anything else you do is an additional benefit to you, yeah, if, mm -hmm. you want to, if, you, if you want to work on writing poems, go write poems. If you want to go fishing, go fishing, yeah? Um, it's, it's not so necessary anymore to think about work as something that you, you know, that, that, that maintains your life, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than, rather than understanding that there is a common, a common and social idea of what living actually means, yeah. So I'm I'm not afraid of the future. I actually think that we're coming. We, as soon as this whole bullshit that is happening now is over, sorry for the word. Um, uh, I hope we're gonna have better times when we're finally going to understand that the capitalist system that we have been experiencing for the last 120 years cannot operate any longer in our current environment because everything else changed. I mean, we're still working with economical ideas that are 100 years old, yeah? 100 years ago, the world looked very different, yeah? So today we have automation, we have global communication, we have like all the things that are changing our social structure profoundly and the, and the work absolutely changed through that. Yeah. So why do we have to hold on to economical ideas that are outdated if our world is in a completely different place? Yeah. So I think that learning about automation, learning about, you know, how, how all the things play out in our world is, is a benefit for you as a designer, as an architect, because in the future, maybe you can focus only on designing instead of having to deal with all the things around a construction site, which are really cumbersome. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's it. That's the thing I love to do. I love to design. If somebody else likes to play music, let him play music and earn his money with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, we should start introducing the artificial intelligence right from fundamental education to, to for them to cope up with the ever changing uh, dynamic nature of, uh, construction industry and um, yeah, which is important in the future as well, not just yeah. And, 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 and by the way, not only in production, like I remember uh, about two months ago or so, I did a very small posting on Facebook where I just said, I have, I have three ideas for a world after COVID. Yeah. Mm -hmm. AI driven politics, full automation and, and um, uh, universal basic income. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think the first idea is a very radical one, but I, I, I think it might be something that is useful uh, to base, for example, political decisions, not so much purely on, um, on gut feeling and voting and stuff like that, but really on information that is, you know, you, if you have an AI analyzing a political problem, yeah, and he can take thousands or millions of examples of how that problem was solved, you as a politician might have a better understanding of how to make a good decision for your population. Yeah. But that's, that's another good. discussion. That's another yeah, discussion yeah, yeah. for another day. <laughs> we, we are, we'll have a separate webinar on that. But there's an interesting question as well from Shweta Jha, one of the participants. She's, um, the question says, 
Um, is there a green aspect of sustainable ways where we can practice artificial intelligence? Can you repeat that, please? Like, how do we connect artificial intelligence for a sustainable way? Like, there's a green ah, yes. Good point. So again, uh, uh, I can point again to the to the ability of AI to really work through data, yeah. And uh, sustainability is of course massively informed by large amounts of data. You have to have weather conditions. We have to understand the, the like you have basically understand the planet yeah, as as an ecological system to create ecological architecture, right? So if if you are are aiming for a specific, sorry, if you're aiming for a specific um, carbon footprint. For example, in your building, you can you can train your neural network to uh, first of all with all the um, um, environmental data that you have for that specific site where you're working. Yeah, because of course every site will be different, and you can combine it with, for exa examples of uh, best practice examples of ecological building, right? And then you have your design. So you you can basically get the neural network to analyze your design and tell you, okay, you're fine. Yeah? You're, you're building, uh, con, you know, uh, complies with the demands for an ecological building, which is good. But on the other hand, that information can also help you to say, hmm, maybe I'm a little bit more ambitious. I'm gonna try to make it even below that. Yeah? So instead of making that an afterthought when you're designing, it becomes a starting point for the design. Yeah? Do you understand? Yeah. Uh, and that's where yeah, I can, and, and that's where I can be really helpful because if you're human, you can only read through, through so much articles about ecological building, and it will give you a basic understanding of it. But you are gonna miss all the nuances in the problem, versus an AI because it can crunch through these big amounts of data, can give you a far better informed decision tool to go ahead with an ecological design. Yeah. We have a um, uh, question from our uh, director, academic director and administration director, uh, Gayatri Ma'am. Um, the question is, which is the meeting point for architecture and artificial intelligence? And does artificial intelligence overpower architecture at any point of time? Yes, I mean, that that's, I don't, I'm not sure if it's possible to answer that question already right away, because it's such a new development that we don't have enough, enough experience really to answer it clearly. But I can say the following. Um, I myself do not consider AI something that replaces me or overpowers me. It's rather like a partner. Yeah, it's, it's like having another designer around you who's pestering you to do a better design. Yeah. So uh, at the end of the day, the decisions are going to be made by you, as you, the designer, not by an AI. The AI is just aiding you in finding the right solution and helping you to find the right way of doing a design. He's, he's like a really, really pesty ar uh, architecture critic. Yeah, he's gonna just, he's gonna, just gonna say, okay, look, here's the data. Your design does not comply with that. So do you understand that there's this possibility for you to, to, to expand your mind through AI, but I don't think it can replace you. Yeah, there's still, as I mentioned, this weirdly unique human ability of, of, of uh, sensibility and agency, or more like sensibility, I would say, that, that actually gives you the, which makes you unique as a designer. And I think that kind of uniqueness of a designer is very hard to replicate with an AI, if not impossible. A very good friend of mine has been trying to do this for the last six years with artificial intelligence. No way, doesn't, doesn't really work that well. So. It's not going to replace architecture. It is, it, it's really aiding and expanding our possibilities. And for me, technology is always in architecture is rather about expanding you as a designer and the possibilities that you have rather than limiting them. Right. So can, uh, there's a question from another participant. Uh, can they design landscape? Can landscape designs be integrated with the AI? Um, Absolutely. Uh, again, it's really all about the training you give an AI. So if you train an AI to, uh, to combine landscape and, and buildings, mm -hmm. uh, it will exactly do that. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the more important problem here is it will give you results and outputs that you as a designer can have a look at. And um, it's still up to you, the designer, to decide whether this is the right way to go or not or if you have to change and tweak the AI 
to to deliver something that is better informed, right? I mean, there's always in AI there's always things like bias and weights yeah, that are included in the in the code. So bias, for example, uh, is when it's when it's uh, trained to uh, to look for specific things. Yeah, uh, this can be a positive thing, but it can also be a negative thing. So you probably all have heard of examples of AI. Uh, applications um, that are racist, and that exists. Yeah, that's that's not an invention. Uh, it would be longer to discuss that, but nonetheless, it's always about the training. Uh, coming back to your question about landscape and building and architecture, absolutely, you can combine those in an AI. Yes. I did yes. I guess Raghav just lost his connection there. The last but one question, I asked the question just because our students are so much designing part sometimes. So I guess they would have heard it from the horse's mouth. So they will now know that designing needs to be their first option. And then they can get down into artificial intelligence. No, I agree. It was nice having you here. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Yeah, I, I, I guess Raghav was not there, so I guess, but Raghav was the one who introduced you to us. So I am sure in future we need to be in touch because uh, these webinars will be on and our students will surely uh, gain knowledge from what you have said right now. So we have our students and we have outside college students also you're participating, even the new students who would be joining architecture. So oh, it's an eye opener for everybody. Thank you so much. I highly Thank appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Rupesh, can you come online, please? I guess Raga was not there. Okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Okay, Raga was not there. The architect Matthias, this is another moderator, architect Rupesh. Actually, Raghav and Rupesh are coordinating for all the webinars that we are hosting in the last two months. Thank you very Rupesh, much for the I invitation. Guess we will, yes, ma'am. We will just close it up. Can you yes, ma'am, we close it. Please? We can. All right. Thanks a lot. It was, it was fun. Sure, sir. Thanks to you and thanks for uh, giving us this good uh, insight into AI. And uh, uh, our students, I think they will have a lot of questions about how... Uh, uh, AI is going to come and stuff like that. Thanks. Yes, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know if you have Thank questions. Thank you, Architect Matthias. Sure. We will be in touch for sure through Raghav. Okay, thanks. Yeah, bye. Bye. Bye, sir. Thanks to all the attendees for attending the session. And uh, uh, please do follow us on all the other webinars which are coming in the next uh, weeks. Uh, so we can uh, we are bringing even more better guests and uh, please do share our webinar and uh, do improvise on that. And thank you uh, all attendees. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Rupesh. Thank you, Arun. I guess thank Raghav's you. line got cut. He says all of a sudden it got crashed. So you just update Raghav, okay? Yeah, yeah, we'll do that now. Thank you. Okay, Arun.